Hey guys! Today we'll be recapping a manhwa called Karina's Last Days. Please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. It really helps our channel grow. Thanks. The story starts off with the arrival of our main character, Karina Leopold, at the home of her fiancé, Lord of Zentar, the Duke Malayon Pestelio. And the award for the male lead with the hardest name goes to... Karina and Malayon's wedding is more than a year away, so the Duke wasn't expecting her arrival. In fact, he's kind of angry that she would turn up without any prior warning. As a Duke, he has a lot of work to do, especially with winter, the season of demonic beasts just around the corner. He is just wondering if he should break off their engagement when Karina appears. Actually, she agrees. She is willing to end their relationship so long as Malayon allows her to live in his estate for the next six to ten months. You know, just casually. Malayon thinks that she's lost her mind, and she really might have. She spent two months traveling just to get here, and left all of her clothes and possessions back in her hometown. It wasn't as terrible as it sounds. Karina wanted to do something by herself for once, and to see the countryside, since she had never traveled before. The girl before him now seems completely different to the one he met at the engagement ceremony. She's smart. Smart enough to know that he kind of hates her, and would do just about anything to cut off their engagement. That's why she brought the necessary documents with her. She's even filled hers out already. Talk about prepared! But does anyone feel like there's a lot more to her story than she's letting on? Begrudgingly, the Duke agrees to take her in for the time being and tells his butler Peng to find an empty room for her. Karina thanks him and promises he will hardly notice her. Then, when she eventually leaves, it will be like she was never there in the first place. In a flashback, we get to see a bit of what Karina's life was like with her family. She had two younger siblings, Leah and Pell, who were a little spoiled. Leah was very sick, so her parents and older brother Enfric took care of her. No one paid much attention to Karina. She was like an outcast. She even looked like one. While the rest of her family are blonde or redheaded, she was born with brown, a color she inherited from one of her grandparents. In the flashback, we see Karina leaving the dinner table and immediately vomiting up her dinner. It turns out she's even more sick than her little sister Leah. The doctor was surprised she could even walk, considering her organs are barely functioning at half their capacity. He diagnosed her with the so-called artist's disease. You see, Karina is insanely talented and has the ability to create miracles with her art, but for every time she has used her powers, it has taken a toll on her body. If she had taken a health exam earlier or told her parents, it might have been curable, but at this stage, there's very little that the doctor can do. He gives her a year to live, and honestly, even that's a stretch. There's a small chance they might be able to extend her lifespan, so he tells her to come back in future. But Karina decided instead to live what little life she has left to the fullest. That meant no one forcing her to be the perfect eldest daughter for her family, and no more relying on other people. She didn't tell her family, in case they looked at her like some kind of burden, or worse, they didn't care at all. She remembered her fiancé and decided to stay with him, although given the way he spoke to her at the engagement ceremony, I'm not sure why she thought that would be a good idea. He compared her to a squid and looked at her like some kind of strange creature. Karina prepared for her long journey by packing a few set of clothes, some money, rations, and some water. She didn't go to breakfast, but no one came to check on her as usual. It made her a little sad, but Karina tried not to dwell on their negligence. All she could think about was her upcoming journey, and in the following week, she received constant reminders that she was doing the right thing. At a ball, two young girls approached her after seeing her chatting with Enfric. They went on and on about how cool he was, how famous and attractive all his siblings were, and all the while they had no idea that one of them was standing right there. Enfric is famous for being capable and attractive, a worthy inheritor to his father's title. Perdon, or Pell, is very popular because of his personality, and Leah, or Arvelia, despite being frail, is one of the most beloved beauties in society. The two girls only know Karina as the plain-looking girl who is always by her sister's side. Wow, that's gotta hurt. You can't blame Karina for walking away and leaving the ball early. While remembering that night, she runs into a young man named Nocturne on the stairs. A long time ago, Karina had feelings for this young man, but he's only ever had eyes for Leah. She resembled his younger sister, so he took extra care and always came for her health checkups. He was the only one who noticed that her health was fading, but she brushed him off, pretending she was only tired. While they were talking, Leah suddenly ran up to her and hugged her so hard she nearly fell down the stairs. Nocturne caught her just in time, which probably didn't help the huge crush she had for him. 
Leah was very sweet and excited to see her sister, but Karina had somewhere to be. She sends her off to see the doctor with Nocturne so that she could get better as soon as possible. Leah protested, saying she felt so much better and wanted to play with her big sister. Way to rub it in, Leah. Even though her health was recovering, Leah still couldn't go outside like Karina could, so she was a little jealous. But that really didn't sit well with Karina. After all, she only ever acted for her sister's sake. Karina has spent half her life looking after Leah, always staying by her bedside while she was sick. She had to ignore all the invitations to social events and never made a single friend, all because of Leah. And her parents never cared for her either. Even on her birthday, they were more focused on her brother, who fell off his horse and was injured. It's no wonder she was willing to take on two months of traveling. I would have escaped way earlier if I was her. Initially, when the twins, Leah and Pell, were born, Karina was excited to be an older sister and play with the new arrivals. But as they grew older, she realized they wouldn't have the ideal sibling relationship she was hoping for. It was mostly her parents' fault, really. Even though she was young and didn't know how to handle small children, her mother blamed her for every time her brother cried, even if he did something wrong. Her attention was always on someone else. She just expected Karina to grow up and act mature for her siblings' sake, even from such a young age. What is with Manwa parents and expecting their kids not to act like kids? It makes no sense! One time, Karina fell sick with a fever and finally received some of the love she craved so desperately. She picked her daughter up and carried her to her bedroom. But on the way there, she received news that something had happened with Leah at the hospital and rushed off to take care of her. She called for a maid and promised to come and check on Karina afterwards. When she protested and asked to go to the hospital with her, her mother said there was no need. She was perfectly healthy in comparison to Leah. And apparently, that meant she just didn't matter as much. Gosh, what a bleak childhood! I can't believe she didn't grow up to become a monster after all this trauma. If she wanted to be complimented or praised, Karina had to step back, always giving up the limelight to her sick little sister, or her troublesome younger brother, who was clearly spoiled rotten judging by what we've seen so far. By the time Karina was 10, she had closed off her heart and swore never to depend on anyone else. She poured all her passion into art, though she didn't realize that what she was doing was magical. The first time she made a miracle, her art literally jumped off the page. She was so excited and ran to her parents to tell them. But before she could even get the words out, her mother interrupted with news that Enfric had won his academy swordsmanship competition. Karina was happy for her brother, of course, but her mother barely batted an eye at her drawing before turning back to the topic of Enfric and how best to celebrate. Honestly, at this point, it's actually kind of impressive how bad a parent she is. It's not rocket science. Sometime later, Karina was drawing when her mother stormed into her room and asked if she had taken some items from the desk. Karina said she didn't, but her mother didn't believe her. Somehow, they ended up in Leah's room, which was dangerous considering her condition. But she never even thought to question Leah. She immediately assumed it was Karina and yelled at her, calling her a liar and a troublemaker. That's when Karina spotted Leah hiding behind her mother's skirts, her little eyes shining with tears. So she gave in, apologized, and took the blame. Then her father asked to delay Karina's birthday party for Infric's graduation ceremony. Again, she gave in, stepped back, and let her brother take the spotlight. Time and time again, she would give up any chance to receive attention or affection, because that was what people expected of her. She kept her focus in drawing, allowing her miracles to consume all her energy. She was good enough to create pets, imaginary friends who would come to life for a short while and comfort her. That's how she ended up so sick, because she made so many miracles that it sapped her energy and deprived her of health. Although she felt bad, she resented her family for never noticing or caring enough to ask about her talents. In her final week at home, she made a trip to the doctor, told him about the journey she was going to undertake, and asked for medicine that would give her strength for the journey. The doctor couldn't do much, but he agreed to provide two months worth of some medicine that would delay the progress of her disease. She stopped by the market on her way home to pick up a skewer for Leah. But as soon as she got back, Peldon grabbed the bag and ran off to eat it with his sister. He didn't even think to offer his sister some, even though she was the one who bought it. Seriously, if I were Karina, I definitely would have snapped by now. That evening, Karina was sound asleep when suddenly her father stormed into the room and he did not look happy. As you probably already guessed, it's about the street food. Her mother is standing at the door with Pell, who looks especially guilty. 
Her father reminds her that Leah can't eat just anything, as if she didn't know. Apparently, Leah threw up that evening and is already showing signs of dehydration, but there's no proof it was actually because of the skewers. And I mean, it was Leah who asked for them in the first place. Isn't she old enough to take care of herself? Apparently not. According to her parents, it's shameful that Karina, who is now an adult, would be so reckless as to give her younger sister an unknown dish. Karina tries to explain herself, but her father won't hear a word of it. He starts yelling, so Pell steps in on her behalf. But Karina knows already that they won't be satisfied unless she accepts the blame and apologizes. And maybe a few weeks ago, she would have. But this is not the same Karina who used to give in. This one bites back. Her father is stunned that she would even dare to talk back. She stands her ground, telling him to speak to Leah if there's a problem. Her mother is just as flustered, taken aback by her tone. But she's not rude or hostile, just honest. She bought the food and ate it herself, so she thought it would be fine. If it wasn't, that's not her fault. Instead of standing there screaming at her, he should go tell Leah to be more careful. Sounds pretty simple when you put it like that. They start to leave, giving excuses for their outburst and asking Karina to be more careful of her sister's health in future. Before they leave, she admits that she's actually pleased. It's been so long since her parents came to visit that she thought they forgot where her room was. Ouch, that one's gotta cut deep. Once everyone has left, Karina lets her emotions out by painting, creating a pretty little fairy to take her mind off things. Which is cute, but shouldn't little Miss Picasso maybe give it a rest? Isn't that only going to kill her faster? After a few days staying in her room, Karina comes out to find the twins waiting for her. Pell feels guilty for what happened the other night while Leah is in floods of tears. She feels terrible for asking for the skewers, especially since she hasn't come out to eat since. Things are a little awkward at lunch that day. Clearly, her attitude has caused something of a change in the atmosphere because her father draws attention to her upcoming birthday. Not to celebrate or ask what kind of present she would like, but because he wants to reschedule. Again? Okay, that's it. Call the parent police. It's not even for a good reason. Her oldest brother, Infrict, is on vacation that day, so he wants to do a picnic instead. Like, that's such a lame excuse. Karina is used to this by now and tells him that's fine, but she won't be coming as she has other business to attend to, by which she means getting the heck out of this place. It's a shame that her family haven't had a change of heart or even cared enough to apologize when asking to postpone her birthday. But that just makes Karina more certain about her decision to leave. The next morning, she grabs a cloak and a small bag of rations and walks away from her home, leaving a note on her desk with just one line. Now we return to the present where Karina has been brought to her new room in the Duke's mansion and is now getting washed up. After her two months of traveling, she has only three remaining pills to halt her disease. She was warned that at this stage, all the pent-up illness would burst out, and she would be very sick for some time. At the height of the oncoming fever, she's supposed to take one pill every two days. Then, it's all downhill from there. I don't know about you guys, but I'd be freaking out if I were her. Karina, however, seems mentally prepared for the pain and determined to use her remaining time well. Once she's washed up, she visits the Duke's office. He explains that winter is a very difficult time for them and he won't be able to pay her much attention, which is music to Karina's ears. She even asks to move rooms further away so that she won't disturb him. Luckily, there's a small place that she can move to right away. Karina thanks him and apologizes for abusing his hospitality. She barely gets out of the office before she starts shaking. Looks like the fever is about to set in. She rushes to her new quarters to rest, but since it wasn't prepared in advance, there are no maids or servants to aid her, so Karina goes hunting for the kitchens, hoping to find a kettle and a towel while she can still walk. The long corridors of the Pastelio mansion are a little spooky at night, so when someone calls out from the shadows, Karina doesn't think, she just swings. Fortunately, she doesn't hit the Duke, who is surprised to find her up and about. I mean, it's just as strange that he's lurking so near her room at this time of night, but sure, let's skip over that one. He can tell something is up, but Karina assures him there's no problem. She tries to turn away and he catches her hand, noticing immediately that she has a temperature. He scolds her for not mentioning it earlier and tests her sight. She can barely even see straight. There's nothing for it. The Duke scoops her up in his arms and carries her to the main house to rest. 
He wants to call a doctor, but Karina outright refuses, begging him not to call a doctor no matter what, as if this whole setup wasn't suspicious enough. Next, we get to see the aftermath of Karina's escape back at the Leopold mansion. A maid found the letter on her desk with nothing but the sentence, I'm going on a trip. Actually, she's been gone for two days already and nobody noticed. Infrick is the first to suggest that maybe postponing her birthday wasn't the best idea. In fact, he came up to her after dinner that night and told her that it's okay to be sad. Just as long as she remembered that their parents loved her very much. Easy for him to say. If it wasn't for Leah, this entire family would revolve around him. She only took two gold with her, so they suspected she hadn't gone far. Rather than being concerned for her safety, her father spent the whole meal planning to scold her when she came home, because of course, he assumed she would eventually. Really, I think this guy deserves a medal for his delusion. It's off the charts! A week or so later, they discover that she's left the Southern Territory, though where she was headed, they weren't sure. Her father, unsurprisingly, didn't seem to care much. He sent more men out to track her down, but only because he was worried about rumors of a runaway child spreading through the town. The only person who seems nervous is her mother, but she can't think what reason Karina could have for running away. Truly, her ignorance is quite impressive. Back in the present day, Karina has woken up to find the Duke sitting at her bedside. He's kind of rough and ready, but he doesn't seem bothered by her in the slightest. Actually, he considers it his responsibility as a host and lord to look after her, especially since she refuses medical treatment. She mentions the medicine she brought, but the worst of her fever isn't over yet. So when the Duke offers to grab it, she takes his hand to stop him. It's kind of difficult to explain why she doesn't want the medicine when there's literally sweat running down her face. Any sane person would ignore her and just go get it, but the Duke can tell she wouldn't take it even if he did. And strangely, despite her physical condition, Karina seems kind of happy. For the first time in her life, someone is nursing her back to health. She's being looked after, holding the hand of a reliable person who seems attentive and caring. He even promises to stay while she's asleep. At least until Peng the butler can take over. As you might have guessed, the Duke isn't normally the type to take kindly to interruptions. But he can tell there's something different about Karina. Already, he's picked up on a few hints that suggest her family situation might not be ideal. And it's only six months, so what's the harm? A week later, her fever has gone down and Karina is already out of bed, smiling and taking a stroll around her chambers. Every morning, like clockwork, the Duke visits to check her temperature and sternly tells her she should still be resting. He's getting more and more fond of her, finding her mannerisms cute and offering to eat lunch together. He's proving to be quite different from the cold, blunt man she first met on their engagement ceremony. Although, that Duke still pops out from time to time, like when he tells her she would only be in the way if she accompanied him to subdue the demonic beasts prowling his territory. He noticed that she was carrying art supplies in her tatty old bag and suggests that she go and watch the sunrise on the roof at dawn. But not without a whole host of conditions. She needs to dress warmly, come down regularly, and let someone know every time she heads up. Wow. It's only been a week, but he's got that protective boyfriend act down already. And he really loves threatening that if she doesn't listen, she'll become a dried up squid. Interesting choice of insult there, Malayon. In a slightly more serious note, he confesses that he was worried about her way back at their engagement ceremony. She was practically dragged to the altar by her maids. It was very clear she didn't want to be there. Karina doesn't really want to explain that she didn't get a choice in the matter that her parents have never cared much about her opinion and that they didn't even bother to attend the ceremony. So instead, she apologizes to the Duke for acting so ungrateful. Of course, he doesn't want an apology. All he wants is for her to voice her opinion when she doesn't like something. From now on, her opinion will always be valued. Aww. He starts asking about her preferences, what foods she likes and dislikes, on the way to lunch. He takes her to a beautiful greenhouse specifically designed to combat the harsh northern weather. Karina has already been warned plenty of times about the climate, but she's not worried. In fact, she's excited to see snow for the first time in her life. The food starts arriving, so the Duke tells the maids to move all the greasy foods away from Karina since she mentioned she doesn't like them. Karina is touched until he asks if she's too frail to even hold the tableware. Good to see he hasn't totally softened up yet. While chatting over lunch, he tells her to call him Malayan, or Lion for short. 
Touched by his sincerity, Karina apologizes for not sending word ahead about her arrival. Lion has already forgiven her for that. He wasn't mad at her, just concerned. What would have happened if she'd gotten trouble on the road and no one knew her whereabouts? Karina hesitates. A part of her wants to tell him the truth about her disease, but even if he's been kinder than she expected, that doesn't mean she can trust him just yet. So Karina simply thanks him for the meal and digs in. She leaves the meal content with both the food and company. Inspired, she heads up to the rooftop to paint and ends up back in bed with a fever the next day. The Duke, of course, is irritated. She went up with only a robe on, so it's no wonder she caught a chill. She also didn't tell anyone she was going up there and failed the third rule of coming down regularly. Lion found her after she'd been up there for hours and gave her a good scolding for it. Anyone else think he's kind of cute when he's mad? He spots the drawing in her hand and asks to see it. Even though she can summon miracles, Karina has never thought much of her talent, especially compared to her extraordinary siblings. But the Duke thinks her sketch is wonderful. He's no expert, but he tells her to have more confidence in herself and that he's looking forward to the end result. Aw, what a sweetheart! Karina still doesn't quite believe him, but frankly, I don't think the Duke is the type to give empty compliments. Look, he's not even smiling! When it's finished, he wants to see the finished product and even offers to show it to an assessor. Karina is just painting for fun, but she agrees to let him see the end result. Then a young man named Maria arrives. He's a doctor. The Duke asks him to examine his fiancée and check her health. Of course, Karina doesn't want her condition to be found out, so she hides her face in her blanket and assures them she'll be fine with some rest. After her little adventure on the roof, Lion doesn't trust her one bit. So he picks her up and carries her over to the bed, much to the doctor's horror. He tells the Duke to be more gentle with her, especially since she's from the South. Maria is kind and gently convinces Karina to offer her hand so he can check her pulse. Uh-oh, is she going to be found out? Maria seems shocked, but doesn't react. He just lays Karina down on the bed and tells her to rest. Once she's fallen asleep, he admits the truth, that her health is failing. He takes her pulse again, listens to her heartbeat, and examines the spots on her limbs. He recognizes the symptoms of the artist's disease and explains it to the Duke. Artistic miracles are less common in the North, since it was only recently conquered, there are mostly warriors in the Northern regions. But Lion knows enough to understand what's going on. The doctor isn't a specialist in this area, so he doesn't know what category her disease is in. But he knows that it can be life-threatening and warns Lion that there's a chance she could die. Now everything is out in the open. I mean, they haven't confirmed that she's on borrowed time, but Lion is a smart man. With the other clues laid out before him, it will only be a matter of time until he realizes why she's here. The doctor regretfully explains that there are currently no known cures to the artist's disease. Even though giving up their passion can help, apparently most artists refuse to stop practicing. Which is understandable. Would you give up if you could literally draw fairies into reality? But the Duke is surprised that her love for art never came up during discussions of their engagement. The doctor leaves behind some medicine for the fever and promises to visit again. Now that he knows that she might be fatally ill, there's no way the Duke will leave Karina's side. He continues to nurse her through the night and steps outside to smoke and sort through his memories. She looked miserable on the day of their engagement and kept staring at her brothers with a lonely kind of expression. While wrapped in his thoughts, a falcon swoops down and lands on his hand. It flies away with a message from the Duke to Payreal, a trusted friend of his who also has the power to create miracles. Meanwhile, in the South, Karina's doctor has decided to make the perilous journey north. Ironically, he's the mentor of Nocturne, a close friend of the Leopold family, and Karina's old crush. The doctor feels responsible for her life, so he's packed his things at once and decided to follow her north. As we've already seen, there aren't many specialists for the artist's disease up there. As far as he knows, she could be dead already. But still, he can't shake a sense of responsibility. He also assumes that she was neglected by her parents, so I guess he feels sorry for her. Nocturne asks for the name of the patient who left such an impression on him, but all he can remember is Rena. You'd think that would be enough of a clue, but Nocturne doesn't get the hint. The Leopold family are still searching for their lost daughter, but the reports have dried up. Her last known location was the capital, and after that, it's a mystery. The Count is kind of just irritated. He doesn't even have her portrait on his desk. If you ask me, he has no right to be annoyed. She wouldn't have gone in the first place if he'd been a better father. 
Maybe he's finally realized that because he decides to go walking through the mansion. He knows where his other kids are, but he doesn't remember where Karina's room is. When she was younger, she asked for a room closer to the stairs because she was scared to be so far away from the others. Her dad just told her to stop acting immature because, of course, he did. He ends up in front of her bedroom wondering when he last visited. Must have been the time she gave Leah those skewers from the market. Isn't it funny how the only memories he has of Karina are from yelling at her? The room is a little cramped, but instead of acknowledging his own neglect, he just blames Karina for not asking for a bigger room. Um, hello? You would have told her to stop being greedy and ignored her like usual. Seriously, I can't stand this guy. He notices the pencils at her desk and unravels a drawing from their holiday a few years back. It's a drawing of her family, but without Karina. He can't even remember if she was there or not. His wife walks in to find him gazing at the picture. She's also been thinking about Karina recently, but her bedroom feels strange, almost like they never visited. Neither of the parents can really remember if Karina liked painting, either. She used to show them drawings when she was a child, but eventually she stopped, so they assumed she gave it up. At this point, it's kind of crazy that their other kids turned out okay. These two don't know the first thing about parenting. They also really don't seem that worried. The only people really concerned for Karina are Leah and Pell. Finally, her mother considers the Duke, but the Count shoots her down, claiming Karina didn't have enough money or courage to get that far from home. Oh, how little he knows. Meanwhile, Leah is reminiscing on the days when Karina looked after her, always reading picture books and falling asleep beside her. She even admits that she used to purposefully stop Karina from seeing her friends because she was jealous of her leaving the house. Oh, cool. What a casual thing to admit now that she's run away from home. Leah is oblivious, but Nocturne knew that actually Karina wasn't so fond of her little sister. But he still can't connect the dots between the fatal patient and Karina. That is, until Leah pulls out one of her old paintings, a picture so vivid that it almost looks real. Abruptly, he gets up, digging through the patient file until he discovers Karina's name and diagnosis on the paper, clear as day. Well, it's official, guys. The news is out. Maybe now her parents will finally realize their mistake. Though I'm sure her dad will still find some way to blame Karina. Back in the north, Karina has woken up. She's still feverish, but she must have been asleep for quite some time. The Duke is nowhere to be seen. She starts to worry. Does he know about her condition? When she first received the diagnosis, she wondered whether her family would finally give her the affection she'd been craving if they heard the news. Now, she doesn't want to know. I mean, it's understandable. If the only way to earn their love is by facing death, then it's not worth it. Here with Lion, she was hoping to live out the rest of her days quietly without disturbing him. But against all her expectations, he's been kind, considerate, and now he knows the truth. How will he treat her now knowing she's on borrowed time? Desperate to erase her mistakes, she remembers a book she saw before that has a charm to erase memories. If she can get to that book, she could use her talent to essentially turn back time. You see, her skills aren't just good for drawing butterflies and summoning fairies. If she really worked, she could even bring a dead person back to life. But only for a short while, until the miracle began to fade. Anyway, she doesn't have the book, so that's not an option right now. She's just considering running away for the second time when Lion appears at the foot of her bed. He doesn't waste any time with small talk. Instead, he immediately asks what stage her disease is at. Karina gets flustered and starts apologizing for being so selfish, for visiting without warning. She wants to act like this never happened, but of course, that's impossible. He just wants her to answer the question, but she can't bring herself to tell him, which is kind of an answer in itself, don't you think? He asks her to at least stop drawing, but Karina flat out refuses. If she doesn't have art, she has nothing. Any extra life she gained wouldn't be worth living. So the Duke switches tactics and asks why she came to him, of all people. The least she can do is tell him that much. Karina warns him it's a long story, but he's happy to listen. It's kind of weird for Karina to finally have someone listen to her side for once, so it feels nice to let it out. She gives him examples of all the times she felt wronged by her family, the many years she had to spend her birthday alone or postpone it for the sake of her siblings. But by the time she's finished, she wonders if actually she was overreacting. But Lion disagrees. She's never complained, never threw a tantrum or harassed her siblings despite the special treatment they received. She's never once overreacted. She starts to get emotional, so Leon sits beside her and orders her to let it all out. I mean, 
He's a little rough around the edges, but it's kind of sweet. He's doing his best to comfort her. So Karina gives in and weeps into his chest until the sun goes down. When the tears have all dried up, Karina is embarrassed, mainly because she left a soggy patch on his shirt. Girl, you're literally dying. A little tear stain is the least of your problems. The Duke tells her to stop apologizing all the time. Degrading herself only makes it easier for others to do the same. Karina is grateful for his encouragement and asks him to call her by her first name, or Lena, from now on. Blushing a little, the Duke leaves her to get some rest. Peng has news from the Duke Periol, who has finally responded to his letter. Periol, by the way, has the gift of healing people through his music. Although his response is not exactly polite, he is on the way. They just need to keep Karina stable until he arrives. In the meantime, the doctor is speeding his way up north through the oncoming winter. It's usually dangerous and practically impossible to reach the northern regions at this time of year due to the weather and demonic beasts. But they're making good time. With any luck, he'll arrive at the Duke's mansion before the first snow. And back at the mansion, Karina has recovered a little. Now, every dawn, she draws while watching Lion Train. Seems a little creepy if you ask me, but Karina seems inspired by his dedication to swordsmanship and uses him as motivation for her own passion. After one night of training, he appears at her door, taking her by surprise. It seems like our girl has developed a little crush. Every time he comes near her, she goes bright red. He spots her drawing and snatches it, immediately recognizing his own outline in the picture. That's awkward. He came to ask if she wanted to accompany him for an inspection of the region. Since she's always cooped up in her stuffy room, Karina is eager to accept and gets wrapped up in her most adorable outfit for the expedition. Does anyone else think she looks exactly like an American girl's doll? No? Anyways, in the carriage he spots a notebook. She's been carrying it around to write down all the things she wants to do with the time she has left. There are still a lot of empty pages, so the Duke tells her not to overthink. The little things are just as meaningful as the bigger ones. He encourages her to step outside her memories and see the world for how wide it truly is. Aww, for such a grumpy Duke, he can be really cute sometimes. At the nearest town, the villagers are throwing a festival to celebrate the harvest. In the winter, the people of the North eat demon meat. Sounds kind of gross, but whatever keeps them fed, right? The roads to the north will soon be closed due to the increase in beast activity, and when that happens, the northerners exterminate any beasts who wander near the village and eat the ones they kill. It's just like normal hunting, really, but with flesh-eating demons instead of animals. And speak of the devil, it seems like another beast has just appeared. Lion rushes to the nearest outpost at once to assess the situation. The soldiers are already facing the beast, a terrifying thing with horns of a bull and the head of a lizard. Lion doesn't hesitate. He jumps down from the city walls, leaving Karina in the capable hands of his guards. She is able to watch from a distance as the soldiers join their duke in battling the beast, known as Hydra, who is especially strong. Even Lion has trouble facing it. Karina wants to help, so when the fight is over, she sprints down to the battlefield to wipe the blood from Lion's head. Um, girly, you're sick. You can't just be running around like that. Worried for her health, the Duke gives her a necklace. It's clearly a pretty big deal because the soldiers behind them start squealing like fangirls when they see that he's given it to Karina. The necklace is glowing softly like some kind of gem. It's called a heron, an artifact that can only be obtained by defeating a demonic beast. It's customary in the North to give them to weak people in the hopes that they will become healthy again. Karina is touched by the gesture and thanks the Duke for his kindness. After the excitement of the attack, they decide to go home and explore the festival tomorrow instead. Just as they're turning back, the doctor arrives. He got here quick. He's pleased to see her and notes that Karina looks better than she did in the South. The Duke introduces himself and invites the doctor back to his estate where they can talk more comfortably. There's also another new arrival currently making his way to the Pestalio estate. Lion's good friend, Periel Carlos, has just arrived. He received a message via Hawk from the Duke not so long ago, asking him to use his miracle to heal Lady Leopold. He also asked him to tell her father where she was, but I really hope he ignored that second bit. Things would get real messy real fast if her family came to find her. After receiving the Duke's message, he went to visit the Leopold household and asked to see Karina's paintings. Her father was a little confused, but he agreed. 
He didn't think much of his daughter's skills, but Periel set him straight. In fact, he decided to dump the truth on him and reveal that Karina has the artist's disease. Oh no. As if that wasn't bad enough, he also conveys that she's staying with her fiancé, the Duke, in the North. The Count is stunned. He didn't think his daughter was talented enough to have the artist disease, and definitely didn't notice anything wrong with her health. Because, of course he didn't. Flustered, the Count asked him to leave, promising to repay him for the information he shared. Periel makes a remark about how he seems more concerned with her location than her health as he is walking out the door, leaving the Count shaking with rage. Well, yeah, serves him right. He still doesn't really seem to believe that she could be talented enough to get the artist disease. He's really the worst. But on top of the heap of bad news, Periel has found some clues for Karina's condition. From judging her paintings, he thinks that it may already be too late to save. After Periel's visit, the Count is met by his son Infric and Nocturne. Immediately, he asks about Leah, and Nocturne confirms that her condition is good. Which is great, but what about your other daughter? You know, the one who's dying? His wife, on the other hand, isn't faring so well. It seems Karina's absence is taking a toll on her mother, who has been having muscle aches due to sleep deprivation and exhaustion. With a few days rest, she'll be back to normal soon. After reporting this to the Count, Nocturne turns to leave. He hesitates at the door for just a moment, wondering if he should mention what he found out about Karina's disease. In the end, he stays quiet, hoping that his mentor, the doctor, will bring them better news in the spring. Now it's just the Leopold men who discuss the visit of Duke Carlos. The Count reveals that Karina is with her fiancé, which comes as a shock to his son. He wants to go right away, but now that winter is setting in, it would be next to impossible to make the journey. The Count is frustrated. The fact that she hasn't sent any letter means she doesn't want to be contacted. Of course, he thinks she's being rude and doesn't consider the fact that she might be really upset with her parents, because why would he? Back in the North, the doctor is explaining how he managed to find Karina despite not knowing her family name or her fiancé. It turns out he's also an artist. He has a talent for embroidery that allows him to locate just about anything using his miracles. Weird flex, but okay. Unfortunately, due to age and the artist's disease, he's slowly losing his eyesight and therefore his ability to sew. The only reason he can still see at all is because he stopped sewing altogether. He stresses to Karina that it's the only way of slowing the progress of the disease. He also mentions that death by artist disease is incredibly rare. That's reassuring to the Duke, but not to Karina, who already knows her clock is ticking. She wants to talk to the doctor in private, so when the carriage pulls up at the estate, she thanks Lion for today and walks off. Real subtle, Karina. If he wasn't suspicious before, he's definitely going to be now. And he isn't the only one. Because of her stellar acting, the doctor has also realized the Duke doesn't yet know that her condition is terminal. She said she was planning on quietly running away so that she didn't hurt Lion when her time comes. Which is maybe the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You think a man like that is going to let you go that easy? Girl, think again. They sit down for tea and biscuits, allowing Karina to apologize for hiding her real identity from him. The doctor isn't bothered, but he was curious as to why she didn't go to the Leopold family doctor. Because she had a huge crush on him, that's why. She explains her situation to the doctor, how she has always been an extra in her own story, how she sacrificed so much for her siblings. Like when she was younger and Pell stole her wallet. She was upset and yelled at him, so he started to cry. Because of that, her mother refused to let her sleep by her side that night. Karina got even angrier and said she wished she never had younger siblings, which earned her a slap. At this point, it seems like that's how they solve everything in that house. And still, somehow no one had any clue why she ran away? The doctor is touched by her story. He says she's brave for staying so long with people who hurt her so much. He also had some struggles when he was younger. A lot of people judged him for being a man who loved embroidery. His parents wanted him to become a knight, but he couldn't give up his passion. And then one day he discovered that he could use his miracles to locate lost items by burning an embroidered image of them. After that, he used his talents to capture wanted criminals, found pets, and even located those who ran away from home. Who knew embroidery could end up being so heroic? But after abusing his talents for two decades, his eyesight began to deteriorate and his sewing got worse and worse. When he was diagnosed with the artist disease, he was ready to give up everything and did the same as Karina by running away, ready to accept the end. 
But on that trip, he discovered a new passion, learning to heal the sick and injured. That's why he couldn't let Karina run off and die. He had to do something, so he came to find her. He congratulates her for being brave enough to fly the coop, especially since her family were making her so miserable. He's still curious about the family doctor she wouldn't speak to, so Karina recounts the tale of when she first met Nocturne at the age of 17. She was immediately taken with him. He was a gentleman, the son of a noble family, and most importantly, a real cutie. He was sweet, always smiling at her and making her feel like her own person for once. He also seemed to like her back, always thinking of her and showing her pretty things like flowers from the garden. But then he would do the exact same thing with Leah, and she realized it was all a misunderstanding. Yikes. Been there, bestie. He paid special attention to her, which isn't surprising since she was his patient. But still, Karina couldn't help but be jealous. One time when they were in the library, a bookshelf suddenly collapsed and almost crushed Karina. Nocturne heard the commotion and ran straight for Leah, even though Karina was the one who got hurt. It was also kind of Leah's fault for messing around, but Nocturne yelled at her sister instead, just the same way their parents always did. He even said it was a good thing the shelf went towards her and not Leah. Wow, and this is the guy she had a crush on? What a douche! Karina stayed in this same spot for hours, hoping he would come back after checking on Leah, but he never did. The doctor knows exactly who she's talking about after hearing the story. It turns out Nocturne's younger sister died suddenly, and now he has a fear of losing patience that makes him act out in stressful situations. Even so, that's no excuse to ignore an injured girl. Anyway, after that, Karina understood the truth, that everything in her life revolved around Leah, and that wasn't changing anytime soon. Even if he knew about her disease, she knew he wouldn't say anything. And I mean, look at what's happened. She was totally right. Little does she know, the Duke is actually listening by the door. He overheard them talking, and when the story turned to her family's abuse, he couldn't turn away. Now he knows the true extent of her childhood and how little of the world she's been able to experience. Fortunately, he didn't hear anything about the stage of her disease. At this point, he is the only one who doesn't know. That night, Karina sits down to sketch a picture of the demonic beast they defeated earlier in the day. She wants to use it to help Lion, though I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work. She's also running out of painting supplies, but she won't ask Lion for help because she doesn't want to mooch off him. I don't know about you guys, but if she's already staying in his house and eating his food, then I say what's the point? I'm pretty sure he even bought the clothes she's wearing. Karina spots the hair and necklace on her desk and takes it in her hands. Of course, it's probably not going to pull her back from the brink of death, but she does feel at ease while she holds it, so who knows? The next day, Karina and Lion head back to the town to enjoy the Harvest Festival, wearing a set of very flashy matching outfits. He wants her to see the temple, get some winter clothes fitted, and find her some more art supplies. That's Lion for you. He just knows she's running out. When they arrive in town, he remarks on how fortunate she is. The doctor came all this way to see her, and soon Periel will be here too. The chance that they will find a cure for her is improving every day. When she hears that Duke Carlos himself saw her drawing, Karina is humiliated. It's not that it was bad, but paintings are very personal, especially to Karina, who treats them more like a diary. The Duke apologizes, and then they are introduced to the owner of the prestigious Chiffon Boutique. Lion asks her to prepare winter clothes, casual clothes, and work outfits so that she can easily move around in. Looks like he'll be buying her a whole new wardrobe. Oh, and he specifically asked for the expensive ones. We do love a man with money. Despite Karina's protest, he tells her to pick out anything and everything she likes. Then they'll have to custom tailor the clothes for her size, so a seamstress gets to work measuring her at once. Karina feels guilty, not just because of all the money he's spending, but because it seems like a waste. She's only going to be wearing them for a short while anyway. The owner calls her over to pick from the designs. Begrudgingly, Karina sighs. She's about to get up when Lion suddenly checks her temperature, asking if she's feeling all right. His hand is cold, a nice relief from the flush she's feeling. Whether it's embarrassment or exhaustion is hard to tell, but an outing like this is definitely going to take a lot of her energy, so it's no wonder she's feeling a little tired. And now with Lion smirking at her, she's flustered for a whole different reason. He asks for her pick of the designs and she tells him they were all fine, which of course means Lion goes ahead and buys every single one of them. Karina leaves the boutique in a huff. 
Honestly, if it were me, I think I'd be kissing him instead. Karina is wondering how the heck she's supposed to repay him when Lion bends down and asks her if she's really okay. Well, if you keep doing that, she won't be. Think of her heart, dude. He starts telling her about the plans for the day, but Karina has stopped listening. She's so loved up that she takes his hand, making him smile. Next, they head to a paint supply store where the owner is a little rude to them. Judging by their outfits, he assumes they're looking for high quality materials, which he doesn't have. But when he catches sight of her hands, he suddenly changes and asks to take a look. Just by the texture of her skin, he can tell that she's an artist, which is a little creepy. With his blessing, she runs off to look around the store while Lion privately requests some items to provide her an atelier. It turns out the owner was also an artist until he got the artist's disease and nearly lost his arm. He stopped painting and moved north, where the pain and heat in his arm lessened until it became more bearable. The Duke wants to ask more questions, but Karina has finished picking her supplies. She was trying to be frugal, but Lion confesses that he's also planning to make an atelier. He just can't help but go over the top. Stressed out, Karina tells him he's gone too far and suddenly gets a shooting pain in her chest. No, oh, no, this isn't good. Her heart gets all hot and becomes agonizingly painful. Then she passes out, and the next thing she knows, she's back at the Pastelio estate in the care of Maleion, who looks very worried. She tries to brush him off, saying it's probably because she didn't sleep well last night, but he can tell by now when she's lying. Embarrassed, Karina asks him not to be so kind to her from now on. Otherwise, things will just be harder when they have to part ways. Yeah, somehow, I don't think he's going to listen. Meanwhile, in town, a pair of border guards are killing time by the city walls when they spot a visitor approaching. The captain orders the gates to open at once. Sir Perio Carlos has arrived. Finally! I think he's had the longest buildup in Manwa history! Unaware of this latest visitor, Karina has finally recovered enough to get out of bed. She had to spend three days wrapped up like a burrito because Dr. Lion refused to let her do anything that might affect her health. Sometimes I think he might be too caring. The first thing she does, of course, is paint. But when she's finished, she suddenly regrets trying to help the Duke as her two-dimensional subject steps through the canvas. The entire estate is shaking when the Duke walks in to find a literal demonic beast in the room with Karina. Like a true soldier, he reaches for his sword, but she stops him. When she gets close, he can see that her eyes have changed color, a telltale sign that she has used her miracle powers. It's cute, but he's annoyed, obviously. Every time she uses her talons, her condition will worsen. She assures him the beast isn't dangerous. At least, it doesn't seem to be. So they try to move it outside, maybe somewhere with less priceless artifacts and furniture. Once the beast, whose name is apparently Hertha, is outside, it's actually pretty tame. Because it's her creation, Karina has no fear whatsoever, which comes as a surprise to the Duke. Even the knights are nervous. It seems like she's connected to the demonic beast through more than just her art. It's like they're one and the same, entwined somehow. The Duke asks why she picked Hertha of all the possible demonic beasts. She explains that she wanted to create a demonic beast to help Malayon. If he had a chance to study the beast up close without it running away or attacking, then maybe it would help them in future battles. The Duke is grateful, but also a little embarrassed he didn't think of that himself. Even so, he doesn't want her to continue sacrificing her health for other people. But Karina isn't helping other people, just him. And she hopes in return that maybe when she leaves, he will give her a hug as a thank you. It's a small thing to ask, but Lion is cold in his response. He agrees, but only on the condition that she never do this kind of thing again. Because of that, she thinks he's angry and doesn't appreciate the gesture. The Duke doesn't have time to correct her before Periel's arrival is announced. Lion is irritated from the moment they walk in, but the young Duke Carlos is all charm and smiles for Karina. He tries to shake her hand and ends up with a clenched fist from Lion instead. I guess now we know he's the protective type. Once they tell him about Karina's demonic beast, he explains that she has the gift of creation. Of all the miracles, it is the strongest and most rare. But before they can talk any more about the beast, Periel hands over a letter from the Leopold family. Memories from her past come flooding back the moment he says that name. Karina is visibly panicking, so Lion reaches to check her temperature and assures her everything is going to be fine. Seeing her distress, Periel apologizes. Everyone makes it clear that she doesn't have to read it, but how could she not? So Karina opens it. It's from her father. 
As you've probably guessed, he has spent most of his ink scolding her for being reckless and playing with the family's honor. He hasn't changed one bit. He ends it with a threat. If she doesn't want to be kicked out of the family, she should come back right away. Wow, he really didn't even mention the artist's disease at all? Jeez. Karina doesn't hesitate. She gets up and throws the letter in the fire. As she should. Then Karina gets a sudden pain in her chest, something she knows is linked to Hertha. They run to the beast, which is on a rampage, and the Duke draws his sword, ready to protect her. Karina begs him not to act rashly. After all, she and the beast are linked. Maybe it was triggered by her emotional state? Turns out, no. The guards just provoked it. Luckily, they don't actually have to fight it. Periel says that a miracle creation can be recalled by its creator, so she approaches the beast slowly and with a wide smile. It seems to be working. The beast isn't attacking. Her gift is truly something special. We'll stop here for today, guys. Yes, I know you want more. Don't forget to ask for the next part in the comment section. Thank you guys for watching and for your support. Please subscribe to the channel. It helps us a lot. Till the next one.